Welcome to an introduction to science, brought to you by Parkbench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. For more information about Parkbench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com. In this short podcast, we shall introduce you to some ideas that may help you go on to gain an understanding of relativity theory. Science is understood more easily if you have an inquiring mind, so we are going to start by asking a number of questions and considering some of the answers we might think are satisfactory. If I am sitting in an airbus on my way from Manchester to Majorca and I watch a steward push the drinks cart up the aisle and then back again, I could ask myself two questions. Is the steward still in the same position? Has the steward returned to where he started from? Without any further consideration or information, then I might be tempted to answer yes to both of these questions. Now consider the view of a girl who is standing on the ground and watching the aircraft fly overhead. If we ask the same questions again, then we would probably have an answer that both the steward and I had moved a number of miles across the sky. The girl would be unlikely to agree we were in the same position that we were thirty minutes beforehand. So is the girl in the same position while she observes the aircraft flying overhead? Let us suppose that her father is an astronaut who is observing the whole situation from his position at a base on the moon. What are his observations going to be? Since the earth is spinning on its axis, then he may well choose to observe that the plane is moving, so I am moving and the steward is moving, but his daughter is also moving. Of course, imagine it were possible to have a vantage point on the sun, and then the observation might be that all these objects were moving, the aircraft, the earth and the moon. So we have to keep on extending this idea. So far nobody is standing still. Imagine if we were able to stand at the centre of our galaxy, somewhat unlikely of course since there is a black hole there. We might have to stand there a long time, several million years, but we would observe that the sun and the hundred billion stars or whatever in the galaxy were all moving around a central point. Now if we were standing on another galaxy we would observe that our galaxy is also moving. So we reach an understanding. We have observed nothing that is standing still. All that we have seen is moving in some way. All motion that we have observed is relative motion. The movement that we observe is relative to another object. The idea of absolute motion, or of standing still, is a redundant idea. If we have failed to provide an explanation for anything that was standing still, then how does this affect our idea about position? Am I seated in a fixed position when sitting in my seat on the aircraft? I am only in a fixed position relative to the seat, since from the ground my position is clearly changing. How do I explain the use of the national grid on maps? Well, the map position only gives one position relative to another position. But there is no grid across the universe. If all movement is relative, then positions are also relative. You may realize that certain ideas, such as motion and position, are a part of Newtonian mechanics. We seem to be challenging these ideas here. In science, an observation is good until someone observes a situation that is not explained by the set of ideas currently being used. Newton's ideas do not explain what we are describing at the moment. Let us continue on this line. You may have done something similar to this at a school with a magnet and paper, and you sprinkled iron filings on a paper that was placed over a magnet. If a compass is moved around a magnet, then the needle changes position, and plotting all of the positions gives a picture of a magnetic field around a magnet. When an electric current is passed through a wire, then a compass needle is deflected. The electric field created by the current has an effect on the compass needle. Moving a magnet into and out of an electric coil will produce an electric current we can see there is a relationship of some sort between electric and magnetic fields. 
The first scientist to express the relationship with equations was a Scot, James Maxwell. His relationships are known as the wave equations. Waveforms are important in science. We know that wave movement can be produced in water and that sound travels in a waveform. With sound we also know that at a particular temperature and pressure the speed at which it travels as a wave is 330 meters a second. A change in a magnetic field produces a change in an electrical field. The waves in these fields will oscillate, that is, behave like a wave that travels. Maxwell predicted that the wave will travel forward at a particular speed, just as a sound wave travels. His equations predict that the speed is equal to the ratio of the strengths of the magnetic and electric fields. When calculations were made, he found that the wave travelled forward at 299,792,458 meters per second. This speed turns out to be the speed of light. Victorian scientists had figured out that speed should be expressed relative to something. They also believed that just as water and sound waves were about moving stuff, so there should be some sort of ether or stuff that accounted for light waves. If this was true, they reasoned, then as the Earth travels around the Sun, it will be moving through the ether, sometimes with it, sometimes against it. This should allow them to detect a change in speed. The result they got was unexpected. The measurements all indicated that the speed of light did not change. Now they were left with a puzzle. Whichever direction the Earth was going, and whichever direction they faced to do the measurement, they always got the same answer. Here is the puzzle in simpler terms. Imagine a beam from a car headlamp and imagine running after the beam. Can you run fast enough to catch up with the beam? Since the beam is always travelling away from you at the same speed, then the answer has to be no. Having already decided that movement and position are both relative, not absolute, where does this leave our understanding of time? Is time relative? or is it absolute? Einstein figured we had to make two important assumptions. In science these are often referred to as axioms. The first is that light travels through space at the same speed regardless of the motion of the source or observer. His second was that you cannot perform an experiment to identify absolute motion. The physicist Richard Feynman stated that the way scientists arrive at new laws is really quite simple. You make a guess, then you figure out what will be the consequences of the guess, compare this with nature by experiment or observation. If it agrees, that is fine. If it does not, then quite simply the guess is wrong. Now we try and apply this using the light clock analogy. This particular one was used by Brian Cox, who is a professor at Manchester University. Imagine two mirrors that are one metre apart. A tick of this clock is represented by light travelling from one mirror to the other and back again. This should take 6.67 nanoseconds. Now imagine that the clock is on a train. We can consider two possibilities. There is an observer on the platform and there is an observer on the train. How fast is the clock ticking for the observer on the platform? If the train is moving, then the light travels further in one tick when observed from the platform. How do we figure that one out? Quite simple. For an observer on the train, the starting point for the light beam and the end point are in the same position. But for the observer on the platform, this is not so. If the light cannot speed up, then the clock must take longer to tick for the observer on the platform. The distance travelled by light is speed times time. To the person on the platform, 
the light has travelled a distance of CT. When the train has moved a distance of VT. The third side of our triangle is 1 meter, the distance between the two mirrors. So, by using Pythagoras, the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the other two sides. Then, CT squared equals 1 squared plus VT squared. We're trying to find T. T squared will equal 1 divided by the result of C squared minus V squared. We know that on the train the tick is simply 2 divided by C, since the light travels a distance of 2 meters for each tick. Now we know the tick from the platform and on the train. The ratio will tell us by how much the clock runs slow. The ratio is 1 divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared divided by c squared. This ratio is called gamma. Gamma will be greater than 1 if the clock on the train is moving at less than the speed of light, since v divided by c is smaller than 1. Only when v gets to be much larger and close to c will gamma differ greatly from 1. Let us suppose the train travels at 300 kilometers per hour. Then we get a very small value for gamma. Staying on the train for 100 years would extend a life by less than one millisecond. We still need to test this idea in an experiment. We need something that can move very fast and has a very short life. A particle called a muon has a life of 2.2 microseconds and can be accelerated around a circular track at 99.94% of the speed of light. If the life is 2.2 microseconds it should do 15 laps. But the idea we have says the life will be extended so it should do more laps. Experiments showed that the muon could in fact do over 400 laps and had a lifetime of about 60 microseconds. Now, if VOC is equal to 0 0.9994, then gamma turns out to be equal to 29. So if we have extended the life 29 times, then the muon should do 29 times 15 laps, which will equal 435 laps. And this is exactly what we observe. Now imagine you could travel alongside the muon. Then you would do 400 laps. How is this possible? It can be explained by shrinking the space. So we now have another idea. Not only can time be slowed down, but space can shrink. Here is an interesting idea since space can shrink. If you were able to travel to Andromeda, the nearest galaxy, at very close to the speed of light, then you would make the return journey in around a hundred years. However, by the time you arrive back, over a million years would have passed on Earth, and that's relativity. This ends our first podcast relating to relativity, brought to you by Parkbench Tutors and narrated by David Hopcroft. Thank you for watching and for listening. We wish you success in your ideas. For further information about Parkbench Tutors, please visit parkbenchtutors.com.